everyone. Welcome, everyone. Oh, hi, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Terrific. All right. Golly, I love the I love the earrings. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. I think her artist name is Margaret of Steel in. Um, oh, where's the Hood Museum again? Dartmouth. Oh, I met okay. Her there, and she's an incredible artist. Are, are they Tutu? Are they in Caribou? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for um, another event sponsored by the Atlanta Photography Group. Those of you who are new to us, um, the Atlanta Photography Group was established in 1987. Um, we are a Artist initiated 501c3 nonprofit membership organization providing opportunities and support to the fine art photography community. Okay. APG is generously funded by the Lubo Fund, the City of Atlanta Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs, the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, and the Georgia Council for the Arts through the appropriations of the Georgia General Assembly. The Georgia Council for the Arts also receives support from its partner agency, the National Endowment for the Arts. APG is also supported by our individual donors, our membership, and our volunteers. And all of these is what makes having events like this, as well as our gallery exhibitions possible. I wanna give a quick shout out to Fulton County because um, due to COVID, they came up with some additional support for the arts and cultural organizations in the Fulton County area. And it made events such as the one this evening possible for us to do virtual events and be able to have the platforms and the support um, available for it. That is all I have. I wanted to thank you all for joining us. I hope to see you at future Atlanta Photography Group events. And be sure to check out our website, atlantaphotographygroup.org, as well as follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Meetup, Twitter, and also we have a YouTube channel where we're posting some of our, um, some of our talks. Um, that is all I have. I thank you all so much. I'm now going to turn it over to Donna Garcia, and um, she is going to lead us through the rest of the program this evening. Thank you all. Okay, so um, again, I wanna thank Judy and APG for hosting this talk for us this evening um, in honor of Native American Heritage Month. And I wanna thank all of the artists and our moderator and Eileen Smithson for being here um, tonight. And let's get right into it. Um, spirit, focus on indigenous art, artists and issues. Um, we welcome you to the final talk for Spirit. And the objective for this initiative is to educate the public through lens-based art regarding the true history of indigenous people and recruit allies and advocates for indigenous issues everywhere but with a specific focus on the US and Canada, where native lands and people are still coming under attack every day. Okay. Nine lens-based artists, all with diverse perspectives were invited to join this initiative. Four spoke October 12th in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day. And we have three with us tonight in celebration of Native American Heritage Month. The list you see here are the full list of artists and Judy will be posting in the chat where you can connect to the actual exhibition. I wanna thank our partners, Lens Scratch, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, Atlanta Celebrates Photography, the Modern Art and Culture Podcast with Darnell Wilburn and Atlanta, Atlanta Photography Group and a special thanks to Judy. Um, here's where you can see the exhibition, which will be up until December 31st, 2020. Go to equaldignity.org spirit backslash spirit hyphen exhibition. And Judy will be putting that link in the chat for you as well. And I'm announcing for the first time this evening that spirit will be um, coming to the Griffin Museum of Photography in June of 2021. 
Um, we're excited and honored to be invited and we will be in the main gallery there. So more to come in the following months. Aline Smithson is the um, edit editor and founder of Lens Scratch. Aline is an accomplished artist, educator, juror, mentor, and as I said, editor and founder of Lens Scratch. None of this would be possible without Aline. After hearing my artist talk at the Los Angeles Center for Photography, she contacted me to ask if I would be a contributing editor for a week of indigenous art and issues. That offer turned into this initiative. Since that time, uh, Aline and I have had several conversations about art and success in the art world. And one of the things she told me that really resonated was she said, as an artist, there is no such thing as making it. Just show up and do the work every day. And if you do that consistently, you've made it. And since 2007, she has literally shown up at Lens Scratch every day so that lens-based artists worldwide could have a platform to be seen, heard, encouraged, and informed. So I want to hand it over to Aline now to just give a short introduction of our artists. You're muted. There you go. Okay. Are you going to stop screen sharing or should we keep going? Um, I can stop. Um, I I might have misunderstood. I thought Shelley was in introducing the artists, but I'm so excited for these three artists because, well, let me back up and just say, as someone who looks at so much photography all the time, every day, I really felt the voices of indigenous photographers were sorely missing from the photographic dialogue. And I wanted to do something about that. And um, thankfully, when I heard Donna's lecture and was really moved by her work, but also about um, just terrible histories um, that she spoke about in her lecture, it, it made me really feel like it was a critical time to share these voices. Um, Donna has been amazing because she, first of all, she said yes. And then she connected me with um, the National Center for Human and Civil Rights. And they came on and did another week of posts about the aftermath of war. Um, and then with uh, APG and with Atlanta Celebrates Photography. And, you know, I, I see the potential and the power of working together, of when we come together and we share in this journey and we expand it, it just, it just gets better and better. And I really thank Donna for teaching me that. Um, so tonight, I, I'm thrilled that we have Keely Keely, I met uh, at a portfolio review, I don't know, four years ago, maybe more, but I have followed your career and just been so, so excited for your successes. And, um, you know, I just feel like all three of the artists tonight are really spectacular human beings. Um, Jeremy doesn't know this, but I was a juror for the Aftermath grant last year and saw your work there and then was so excited when Donna said that she was featuring your work and because I'm a huge fan. And then Kaylee, oh my God, what amazing work. And I was totally unfamiliar with it. And this is what is so exciting for me as, a, as an artist and as an educator, when someone else brings their voice to Lens Scratch and really shares things that I'm not aware of. So I am now very aware of you, Kaylee, and just keep going. Your work is spectacular. So 
that's my introduction for you three. And I just want to say thank you to Judy and to Donna um, for this evening. And I'm just so, I'm so excited to hear all of you talk about your work. Great. Thank you, Aileen. Um, thank you, Aileen. Uh, and I know, um, Aline, I know that you can't stay with us through the whole presentation, but thank you so much for being here. I think I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to start sharing my screen again and um, introduce our moderator and narrator for the evening. So let me do that. All right, here we are. So our, this is uh, Shelley Danzi. Shelley is a powerful creative writer, voiceover artist, and an arts columnist for artsatl.org. She has written for multiple national publications, including the Huff Post, and she has an MFA in writing from Savannah College of Art and Design. Shelley has an extensive background in broadcasting, and she will be our narrator, moderator, and guide this evening as we discover the story of these three amazing artists tonight. Please check out her upcoming interview on the Modern Art and Culture podcast next week, and Judy will put a link um, to Shelley's information in the chat. So I'm going to turn it over to Shelley. Great, good evening. Thank you so much, Donna, and good evening to all of you. Donna, Within... share your screen. Yes. Oh, is it not shared? No. Oh. Okay, sorry. It's okay. One moment, please. <laughs> Ooh. Absolutely. All right. Well, darn, Shelly, sorry. There it goes. Yeah, you're, you're, you're great, you're great. <laughs> so let me get where we need to be here. Okay. Sorry. But Perfect. Sure. While she is getting that up and running, again, we are pleased to have with us artists, Jeremy Dennis, Keeley, Yuyen, and Kaylee Spitzer representing the collaboration of Kaylee Spitzer and Bubsy. And tonight we will journey through the artist's work, open up the, to the panel with a couple of brief questions, and then go to questions from you. If you have any questions or comments as we go along, please place those in the chat and we'll turn that over. Uh, Judy will be monitoring that and we will get to those at the end. All right, so shall we get started? Photographer Keely Yuyen illuminates the hidden stories of polar regions, wilderness and indigenous communities. Informed by ancestry that is both Nanai, Siberian native and Chinese American, he explores the human relationship to the natural world from different cultural perspectives. Keely is an award-winning contributor to National Geographic magazine and other major publications. Both wilderness survival skills and empathy have been critical for Keeley's projects in extreme environments and cultures outside his own. On assignment, he has fled collapsing sea ice, weathered botulism from fermented whale blood, and found kinship at the edges of the world. In addition, Keeley builds traditional kayaks and contributes to the revitalization of northern indigenous culture. Keeley is a 2020 Nia Taro Storytelling Fellow, Pulitzer Center grantee, and one of PDN's 30 emerging photographers. His work has been exhibited worldwide and received some of photography's top honors. He currently has work in an exhibition at the British Museum titled Polar Regions, which runs through February 2021. He is based in Seattle, Washington, but can be found across the circumpolar Arctic much of the year. In his series, Masks of Grief and Joy, Yuyen takes the viewer to Gambel, located on the Northwest Cape of St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Sea, about 200 miles Southwest of Nome and just 36 miles from the Chukchi Peninsula in the Russian Far East. 
Death is not uncommon here on Alaska's St. Lawrence Island, whose population is entirely Siberian Yupik. The people of St. Lawrence Island have been ravaged by colonization. American commercial whalers brought disease epidemics, followed by children being forced to leave their parents and attend boarding schools. An entire generation was subjected to the extreme abuse and cultural genocide of those schools. The ensuing trauma has led Alaska natives to the highest rate of youth suicide in the world, 13 times higher than that of American youth overall. In 2018, when Yu Yen arrived in Gamble, one of the island's two communities with about 700 residents, he took on the task of creating a suicide prevention program in collaboration with the art teacher and the staff at the Gamble School as a form of art therapy for the students. One of the first activities was for the students to create paper mache masks. Arctic indigenous cultures such as the Yupik are famously laconic. So this mask making activity was designed as a socially acceptable way for teenagers to work through suppressed emotions. He asked the students to work on two masks, one representing their internal grief, the other representing their joy. He worked with his students for three weeks, taking cues from both traditional Yupik masks and references to pop culture. The artist made portraits of the students wearing their masks in places that brought them closer to their grief and their joys. For grief, several students led him outside. Most of the students wore their grief masks outside and their joy masks inside in the comfort of their homes. He went to a basketball court. A reminder of a well-loved fellow student and basketball player whom they said had recently committed suicide. Standing in that place, Yuyen could feel the pain carried by the students, as well as their fortitude in facing it. During their time together, the students reflected on suicide in their community and how it had affected them. It was clear that it affected just about everyone not only the suicides, but there were also deaths from cancer and accidents. Despite all of the tragic losses, most of the students seemed to have a healthy approach to life. Their strength proves that despite centuries of ongoing trauma, indigenous communities will continue to heal with each generation by learning to believe in themselves and preparing a way for their communities into a new era. Jeremy Dennis is a contemporary fine art photographer and a tribal member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation in Southampton, New York. In his work, he explores indigenous identity, culture, and assimilation. Dennis was one of 10 recipients of a 2016 Dream Starter grant from the national nonprofit organization, Running Strong for American Indian Youth. He was awarded $10,000 to pursue his project titled On This Site, which uses photography and an interactive online map to showcase culturally significant Native American sites on Long Island. Dennis received the Creative Bursar Award from Getty Images in 2018 to continue his series titled Stories, Indigenous Oral Stories, Dreams, and Myths. The artist staged supernatural images that transformed these myths and legends to depictions of an actual experience in a photograph. Dennis holds an MFA from Pennsylvania State University in State College, Pennsylvania, and a BA in Studio Art from Stony Brook University in New York. He currently lives and works in Southampton, New York on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. In his series, Nothing Happened Here, 
Jeremy Dennis captures surreal, almost cinematic production in the stillness of one picture. Through the use of digital photography, these images have a haunted urgency and profound dislocation from their landscape, which is uncomfortable yet familiar. This photo series explores the violence and nonviolence of post-colonial Native American psychology. These images illustrate the shared trauma of living on indigenous lands without rectification. Reflecting upon his experiences and observations in his community, Dennis illustrates the burden of loss of culture through assimilation, omission of native history, loss of land, and resulting economic disadvantages. Though science has solved many questions about natural phenomena, questions of identity are more abstract, the answers more nuanced. His work is a means of examining his personal identity and the identity of community specifically the unique experience of living on a sovereign Indian nation reservation and the problems that are faced. The arrows in each image act as a symbol of an everlasting indigenous presence in each scene. Dennis's decision to place non-native subjects in these tableaus creates a tension that forces the viewer to consider the idea that there is a shared burden and poses the question, how do we overcome our troubled past? As more truth about the early contact period between colonists and indigenous groups comes to light, it is difficult not to link the current dilemma of power gained or lost with that disturbing history. In 2020, uh, Jeremy is focused on working to restore an old family home on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation, which will become a communal art space. He will tell us more about that project during our Q&A. Braiding Wounds by Kaylee Spitzer and Bubsy. Body as sight, carrying blood memory forward, interrupted by colonial acts, relationships revive, weaving together the strength of ancestors. Through generative collaboration, Kaylee Spitzer, Jewish and Cascadina, and Bubsy, European settler, hold space for one another, braiding their ancestral connections to heal colonial wounds. Created on the unceded lands of Musqueam, Squamish, Slaweta, Sinex, and Miskba nations, Braiding Wounds is a series of tin type images with digital drawings that speak to the restorative labor of caring, deep listening, witnessing, and remembering. Over the past 15 years, Kaylee and Bubsy's kinship grew over their love for art and its capacity to create space for resurgences. This is the first in a series of collaborations that reveal points of connectivity between them, the continuums of their ancestral strength and the land towards a deep love and kinship that holds space for one another. This space is where sites of colonial trauma shift into restorative acts of caring, witnessing, and decolonial love. Kaylee Spitzer is a photographer living on the traditional unceded lands of, Les, of the Slavoita, Squamish, and Musqueam peoples. 
Kaylee's work embraces the stories of contemporary BIPOC, queer, and trans bodies, creating representation that is self-determined. Kaylee's collaborative process is informed by the desire to rewrite the visual histories of indigenous bodies beyond a colonial lens. Kaylee is Cascadina from Delu, Lower Post, British Columbia, on her father's side, who is a survivor of residential schools and Canadian genocide. Her mother is Jewish from Transylvania, Romania. Kaylee's heritage deeply influences her work as she focuses on cultural revitalization through her art, whether in the medium of photography, ceramics, tanning hides, or hunting. Her partner, Bubsy, is a mixed media artist who was raised by the river of the Slocum Valley. Bubsy creates art in many forms. She is a weaver pulling together past, present, and future narratives with all of the stories they hold. Now that you have seen this powerful work, we're going to go ahead and let you hear from our artists. And again, if you haven't been doing so, you can place questions in the chat. Uh, I'll start things off with a few roundtable questions, and then we will definitely get to your questions. So this question is actually going to be for all three. Um, you all are compelling storytellers, and I'd like for you to tell us about the process of threading a narrative through your work. And this might include relationships with your subjects, decisions about what processes will be used, um, or even why certain symbols appear in your work. So we'll get started um, with um, Keeley. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. I, you know, uh, for me, I'd say it's a. Uh, it may it's going to be different for different types of artists, but for me, I, as a documentary photographer, uh, I work in um, the world of journalism as well as art. And you know, um, I I would say I think, you know, my editors at the Geographic have said we work we exist at the intersection of journalism and art. And so, um, you know, when we're when I'm working on a story. I, I, I'm always, I'm very much a journalist. I have to think about um, story first and foremost. And in a lot of ways, I think that the, uh, when it comes to being an indigenous per person working on art, that's really kind of central, story is everything. Um, and especially we, as a journalist, um, I'm always thinking about the care that needs to be taken when collaborating on uh, telling a story that belongs to another people, right? So for indigenous people, we have a, such a different protocol for permissions. Um, generally speaking, for indigenous peoples, the, um, unless you ask, the answer is no. <laughs> you do not have permission to do something. Uh, whereas in the Western world, you have permission to do something unless someone tells you no. Um, so it's a very different kind of thing and collaboration is the name of the game. But um, you know, in putting together a story, it's really, uh, to a large extent, um, for me, it's about a lot of research. Um, before I go in, I try to understand as much as I can about something. And then it's about actually being there and listening to, uh, listening and seeing what unfolds and, and understanding um, what, how the thing that I'm seeing in front of me is, uh, has come to be the way it is because of history. And so I'm trying my best to be um, an ambassador or a liaison between two different cultures. And that is the hardest part in a lot of ways. I'm, I think in the past, um, especially at places like National Geographic, the, uh, it, it has long been heavily skewed towards the audience, the culture of the audience, as opposed to the actual culture and that we're looking at when, when you know, it's between cultures. And so it's really important to me to lose myself and lose my own cultural blinders so I can get to a point where I can actually see what it is like to see the world through the viewpoint of another culture. Uh, so in threading together, trying to put together uh, a narrative, sometimes it can be pretty loose, I would say. Um, like Masks of Grief and Joy is pretty loose because there's not a, um, the story of suicide is such a difficult one. You're telling uh, like, what and understanding this ultimately uh, while working on this, uh, you know, it 
go into something kind of fraught, which is telling the story of suicide, uh, which of course is just like, it's such a negative uh, thing, has such strong negative connotations. And mostly when you talk about indigenous peoples, that's mostly all you hear is this negative narratives. But really uh, the story here, just like with most of the stories that I work on, I found is the real story is a story of resilience. Like you see these kind of, like there's that sad mask on the right, right? Um, this really intense one where this, this girl, she lost her, her dad to suicide. But um, on the left is, uh, you know, uh, another girl who uh, who's like her happiest place is in the kitchen look at all those family photos you know how happy is that and the the resilience is really clear like if you just lost 80 percent of your population to disease and then the rest of them got moved off the island coming back and being in this really happy place that's the real story there and I think once I realized that and I started asking around lo and behold sure enough the real story came out which is that um, mental health uh, mental health programs that are sponsored by the community that come from within the community have created a drop in suicide for the first time in history. And it directly coincides with, um, with the uh, changeover from suicide, mental health programs that come from the outside with essentially white people flying in from uh, the Alaskan mainland and creating these mental health programs. Um, and they finally realized we're just losing money. Suicide's still continuing all this, none of this has changed when they said, all right, instead here, community, uh, here are some money and some, some support. Why don't you guys create the program? And sure enough, they started the program and 10 years later, the suicide rate is falling uh, and falling relatively quickly. So uh, I think figuring out the narrative um, and how to thread these kinds of things together is just back and forth between the actual theme and what is really going on and um, how to find the visual representation of those things that tell the story. All right, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> that was a uh, powerful, powerful words, Keely. Um, Kaylee? We're in luck, the puppy is chewing something and not screaming. I just answer the same question. Sure. Which was about the, the compelling storyteller's story. She was yelling for a minute. Uh, not not a problem. Just just whatever you would like to share, but a little bit about your the process um, just of threading the narrative through your work. Right. Okay. So first of all, um, I just like to acknowledge that I'm calling from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. I'm really happy and honored to be here with all of you. Um, I'd like to thank Bubsy for making this incredible work with me and interesting me to speak on behalf of both of us. She wasn't able to make it today. I'd also like to thank my mentor, Will Wilson, who was in the show as well. And I owe many of my opportunities to him. He's a wonderful teacher. One more disclaimer, I'm a nervous speaker. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm alone in my house or not. And <laughs> I usually speak from the heart, but I've actually, this is a complex, this is a complicated project for me to speak to. And so I've written some of it down um, and I'm gonna read off of that, which isn't my normal process. So Bubsy and I made the work out of deep love for one another. It stems from our own journeys of healing, which then expands to our communities. It references reconciliation, which has been a very problematic process. In some of the works, we use the dogwood flower to symbolize colonization. There are two types of dogwood flowers in BC, um, one of which was imported from Europe and planted for the queen's arrival. Um, the other one is indigenous to this area. And the one that we've used is the one that's imported. Uh, <clears throat> and we felt that it was poignant to include this flower in our images to reference the invasive and devastating ongoing effects of colonization. It's also illegal to pick the indigenous dogwood, which I think speaks to our legal rights or lack thereof as indigenous folks in so-called Canada. Um, and a lot of the threading narratives, woven meanings in our work, we're still figuring out how to talk about. A lot of it was subconscious and has very deep meaning, speaking to blood memory. So 
this is a really great challenge to try and verbalize what we're trying to do as visual artists, which can be really challenging, especially in the context of the very limited English language. Oh, that's, I'm also, that I'm done. <laughs> yeah. So um, can I say something before we move on to Jeremy? Can you hear me? Cool. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, just for one minute, when I was selecting artists for the show and, and the feature on Lens Scratch, um, I didn't know any of these artists. Aline uh, showed me Jeremy's work and I found Keely. Um, Keely's pretty easy to find. <laughs> because he's got a very broad reach. Um, and I really was looking to um, have an even amount of, of women and men in the show. And when I found Kaylee's work, it just took my breath away, literally. It is phenomenal. And the fact that she um, has so much yet to come um, as far as far as being an artist and and I mean it is truly amazing. It was it's the quality of this work, the lyrical quality in this work is just stunning. So I just wanted to say that and surely I'll mute myself now. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. And you jump in as you as you need to. That is not a problem at all. Oh, so Jeremy. Uh, sure, I could uh, speak to narrative in my work and um, the symbols and things like that. Um, just to give a little bit of background and technical for my work, I look from everything from uh, creation myths and stories to historical documents to uh, inform my work, uh, which then leads to the uh, creation of uh, photographs. And so um, one of the uh, areas I'm really interested in is the uh, pre-contact life um, where I'm from and my ancestral land here on uh, Long Island, New York, or uh, Shinnecock traditional territory. And so one of the, um, I guess you can call it symbols in my work, is the uh, traditional regalia or the uh, leather clothing that we uh, wore and still wear today at uh, powwow and other celebrations. Um, another reason I really love regalia is because it extends that whole spirit of powwow which um, unfortunately only lasts four days uh, out of each year, but I, I think it should be uh, celebrated further. And um, I love looking at these um, earlier histories. Um, here at Shinnecock, we've been on this land for 10,000 years. And um, one of the kind of practical things of looking at the past and looking at history is that um, at the moment, um, even beyond Shinnecock and Shinnecock community, were uh, fractured as a nation. And so if you look at history, you're able to look at things that um, connect each of us uh, beyond politics and family drama and conflict. Um, and so throughout my different uh, photo series, um, they all re relate to one another through that conversation of um, our common ancestry, um, some of our shared history, if you're native or non-native. Um, sometimes I criticize my own work because I <laughs> later reflect and say that was uh, that was good or that was bad, and I uh, branch out from there. Um, so that's my response to that. Thank you, um, Kaylee. Um, if you would share a little bit about how your collaborative process with Bubsy um, has informed that kind of, as you said, the rewrite of visual histories of indigenous bodies beyond a colonial lens and um, your use of several different processes. We mentioned, of course, the uh, tin types in illustrations, how that plays a role. Yes, thank you, Shelley. Okay, again, I've written this down. <laughs> so I'm gonna read from it and then I might expand. Um, I'm also dyslexic, so I really don't usually read my writing. Uh, okay, so I feel that our current existence in this world as Indigenous people in itself is rewriting history. 
We are inherently resistant and resilient people. Resilience is a complicated word. It almost implies that we have a choice in the matter. We do not. The violence committed against us forces us to be resilient. In this era of settler colonialism and extreme racism, we must make space for our indigenous kin to be represented accurately. We are doing this in all forms, in all roles. Bubsy and I are rewriting our histories to heal from the colonial lens that mainstream media, sorry, mainstream society sees us as and show us as we actually are. We are multifaceted beings that all have different stories that will never fit into a colonial lens. We are mixing a central process, tin types, accompanied with digital drawings and scan press flowers, combining the new and digital age, which I did not think of first. If any of you have seen Will Wilson's talking tin types, he is a master of combining these things among many other artists. <clears throat> Combining the new and digital age, symbolically, we are reflecting how we can be traditional and modern people at the same time, that our practices have no bounds, that we collectively embody so many complex histories. Indigenous people are and have been historically adaptable out of survival. I see this woven into our work now in a different context. We are adapting to the ever-changing world, grounding in where we come from, expanding into Indigenous futurism. And I, also just want to mention that all of the tintypes are collaborative self-portraits. I'm not sure if anybody has made a tintype before, but to do a self-portrait of yourself nude and then have to get clothed and run through a shared studio hallway to get to the dark room to develop it is quite a complicated process. So there, I think that, not that that directly has to do with the question of visual histories of indigenous bodies beyond a colonial lens. But I think there's something to be said to this century old process that is such a slow process, but it also mimics and feeds our need for instant gratification. And I don't even know if I have words to put together. Oh, my puppy needs to be. Um, exactly. Hmm. I think I've lost my train of thought a little bit. But the medium, I find that the medium has a life of its own and a spirit to itself. And for me, as somebody who's quite a perfectionist, letting go to this medium and all of the variabilities is such a beautiful process. And I don't really know how to make that come full circle right now, but it's definitely an important piece of it. Donna, did you want to sh share something? Uh, no, but I have made tintypes and I have done them nude and I, I can totally share that sentiment. Keely, um, this question is for you. Um, you mentioned in your statement just how Arctic indigenous cultures such as the Yupik are famously laconic and how mask making was designed as a socially acceptable way for teenagers to work through the suppressed emotions that we mentioned already. Um, if you would kind of talk to us a little bit about the animism or spirituality in this community and its connection to its healing trauma. Uh, yeah, well, Animism is a uh, is a kind of it's a kind of a tough step subject these days because with the um, with a few exceptions um, it, my my culture actually is one of these exceptions but for the most part uh, dominant world religions have come in and superseded animism so the the animism is still there um, like that that kind of spiritual belief is still there but you see it in these small sort of subtle ways um, it's not immediately obvious uh, where things. Uh, what things are animistic, for, come from an animistic tradition and what things are Christian, for example. So Yupik um, have been colonized by Christianity um, and for a really long time. So the Arctic is actually, um, I would say by far the region of the world that is the most uh, religiously colonized. People are, uh, at, you know, in elders um, work uh, quite hard actually at um, suppressing uh, 
suppressing their previous beliefs of the culture, um, especially because of boarding schools and other things like that. But, um, you know, uh, animism in, in a lot of ways is just like a way of kind of drawing strength from the land uh, because you're seeing um, and your ancestors, right? So, so everywhere you walk around and see things, there's just a, like a living nature to everything uh, in the world around you. And if you're in tune with that thing, you see the spirits will come and talk to you, or you can see them uh, interacting and influencing the world around you. And oftentimes, uh, you know, in when the Western world, what would normally be called ghosts, are generally seen as quite negative. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no one really likes to, uh, you know, like uh, buy a house that's got ghosts in it, right? So, but um, for indigenous peoples, by and large, um, you know, this isn't true for every culture, but for many cultures, having ghosts in it is a great thing. That means your ancestors are there. Um, and, uh, you know, um, for someone like my culture, uh, the house spirit is an indelible spirit that each home has and it guards your home. You gotta have it. You know, if you have a house without a house spirit, then uh, don't go there. That is a dangerous place to be because <laughs> that means all kinds of other spirits could be lurking about in there that might not have great intentions. I mean, so, um, so in terms of like healing for the culture, uh, I don't know how much animism has to play in terms of like the healing. I, I think that people find um, solace and a lot of healing from the land itself. Um, and whatever interpretation, whatever kind of spiritual uh, connection people take, you know, bring from the land, the land kind of supersedes all of those human beliefs in a way. Um, it, it heals us all in this way. And time uh, um, is a really big one. So time is the, is the thing that heals because each generation, um, heals it does its best to make the world a better place for its uh neck for the next generation especially native cultures are really big on the relationships and for preparing the world for the next generation so by the time the next generation rolls around some of that trauma dies away with the previous or maybe not dies away but is hidden is more insulated so it allows people like um of my generation for example to be able to do things like revitalize boat building like do stuff uh where we can uh, interact with computers, where we can do work in the arts and all this kind of stuff. Uh, otherwise, um, otherwise, probably I, I would be doing something that is not nearly as fulfilling. <laughs> I have this feeling. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, but in terms of the the Yupik on Saint Lawrence Island, it's a particularly special case. It's a particularly um, extreme example and I would have to say that the, much of the healing is actually going to come believe it or not from economic success uh, right now it's a place that's been colonized but has had none of the reaped none of the rewards of colonization so you know when you're colonized and you have to adopt an economic system and a worldview that comes from somebody else um, usually at the very least you get the economic um, rewards that come with it, which means, you know, the ability to feed yourself a little bit better and be able to have uh, an easier way to keep a roof over your head. Whereas um, on St. Lawrence, um, there's no, none of that exists. Um, people who live on St. Lawrence will probably, most of them will probably never leave the island in their lifetimes. Um, met most of the kids who leave the island to go get scholarships and go to the University uh, of Alaska. And, uh, in Fairbanks or Anchorage or something like that, most of them come back because the world outside is too different. It's too, um, everyone for themselves, too selfish and they hate it. You know, so um, a lot of what has to come for St. Lawrence Island to really heal itself is going to be um, a tighter integration with the rest of the world. And then I think future generations will be able to carve out the things that they really want from their culture. You know, that uh, Yupik will basically say, hey, this part of our culture we really love, we really love the stories, we uh, really love our family ties and all that kind of stuff. That's not going away, but we would sure like to be able to eat something. <laughs> that would be really nice, especially since climate change is taking a tremendous toll on the food over there. Um, as you can see that, that shoreline right there, um, that is taken in March, which is still winter time. And there should be, those sh shorelines should be packed with thousands of walrus. There are the closest walrus when I was there was 200 miles away, which is, I uh, uh, can't remember what it is, like 12 gallons of diesel or something like that, like $200 worth of diesel fuel to get out there. So um, 
it's pretty significant. It's a really big deal. So people that in previous years there, there was uh, what was considered a famine and you're actually flying food in from the mainland United States to drop food to this place because uh, climate change has altered that place so much. So it's a crazy thing. A lot of times I would say, uh, sorry, I keep, just you keep yakking away here, but I would say that, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, resilience and adaptability, these things like we're also woe is me about climate change, you know, in a lot of ways, we're like, oh my God, look at how, uh, how victimized these people are about climate change. You know, a lot of ways, I think uh, the real story for indigenous peoples is that we're actually extremely adaptable, flexible and resilient. All it really takes is just removing the barriers, you know, just stop holding your heads down below the water and it'll, things will be fine. We'll figure it out. <laughs> we will have for a very long time. But it's the, the um, sort of actively being held under the water uh, kind of thing that's still going on that makes it really hard. Yeah. Thank you so much, Keely. Um, Jeremy, um, if you would speak to overcoming a troubled past, right? You mentioned how, how do we do that? And how does your work and community activism kind of speak to that process? Oh, sure. Um, I'm kind of happy I'm going third because uh, Kaylee and Keely's um, kind of answers uh, overlap a lot with um, perhaps ways I could answer that. Um, I should also mention that Shinnecock um, if you're unfamiliar with the Hamptons, we're um, a community of um, maybe um, 800 people on this 800 square acre reservation. And um, we live in a place where the phrase McMansions was invented. And so 60% um, of uh, families on Shinnecock are below the poverty line. And so um, a lot of the things that we're trying to do to overcome our um, past and um, sort of the oppression of colonization is uh, economic development. And so um, at every turn, uh, just like uh, Keeley said, um, just at the state level or federal level, um, all of our initiatives are getting uh, resistance, even though we have such a small um, kind of physical and economic impact. Um, still, um, for some reason, uh, we're based in New York State. Um, the state itself is making it difficult for us to uh, achieve those things. And so um, just like in the uh, introduction, I, I received a grant to pursue a project called On This Site. And On This Site has been going on since uh, 2016, which is a um, landscape photography based uh, history uh, project where I'm trying to uh, do a survey of all of Long Island, New York's indigenous history and um, if you go online, you can uh, get a free access to this uh, resource. And um, my kind of theory is that in order to overcome our troubled past, we need to um, actually know what that troubled past is. Um, when I was in public school, I, I learned the um, myths of Thanksgiving. I learned that um, in some sense, like the native people just were our friends and somehow they disappeared. Um, even though I was part of that um, group of people. And so what I'm trying to do is just create this uh, public resource that is uh, free to access, that people can look at, um, create their own um, kind of conclusions, and then come together with a um, common understanding of how we got here. Um, just over and over for the past uh, couple of years, I keep wondering how can Shinnecock exist in the Hamptons? It's just these two um, kind of drastically on the different ends of the scale of wealth and poverty um, live right next to one another. And so um, in my work, I, I try to look at history. I try to look at uh, psychology. Um, one book I was recommended years ago is uh, Native American Postcolonial Psychology by Eduardo and Bonnie Duran. And um, just like in that book, a lot of what I do as an artist is uh, just try to trace present day issues with um, kind of their origins. And usually it's um, some sort of uh, colonial um, history coming and uh, manifesting itself in present day. And so by looking at the past, we're able to uh, resolve problems in the present. Thank you, 
Thank you so much, Jeremy. Just want to ask no, no. all of you, well, pose it to all of you, and um, if all three of you want to answer, that's great. Um, because you all have talked about healing, right? So um, discuss how the concept of healing is illustrated through your work and how the relationship with or through your subjects has reflected that healing, um, that healing's possible, but it's still ongoing. Um, You're muted, Shelley. Jeremy, would you like to start since your uh, picture is up? Oh, sure. Um, so just in the, <clears throat> excuse me, just in the theme of healing, um, just in my personal experience growing up and even today, um, I think everyone knows the history of um, the Indian removal of 1830 and the Trail of Tears. And so one of the very basic um, things we're trying to accomplish as the uh, Shinnecock people is just being acknowledged as um, actual native people, as a sovereign nation and self-governing nation, governing nation. And so um, <clears throat> because we're uh, east of the Mississippi, because we're in that um, kind of radius of early contact and colonization, um, that narrative that we're no longer here is so prevalent along with um, because the fact that we just didn't keep uh, intermarrying within our own community. Um, we don't have those um, stereotypical um, kind of uh, physical appearances. Um, even face-to-face -face people don't um, acknowledge that we are native because of that and thanks to Hollywood and popular culture. And so the uh, work that's on screen now, uh, nothing happened here. I wanted to address that um, sort of uh, ignorance or um, apathy that um, we, we are faced with here at Shinnecock. Um, and so what the work uh, sort of represents or presents is the question, um, if nothing happens uh, in my region, like if we're just going to admit all of this history and overlook it and kind of celebrate America um, at the signing of the declaration and perhaps in these um, images that were made in 2018 and to the present um, are nothing is nothing also happening in these images as well and so it's a uh, it's really a conversation starter and um, I think people with their own um, intuitive sense kind of uh, immediately see it as sort of like this um, American work or this uh, indigenous um, presence within the work and so just as like a technical um, mention um, each one of these arrows are dowel rods, uh, things that you use to make furniture. And um, just like Kali's work, I um, have a tripod and a timer, and I essentially just poke my um, friends and volunteers with these uh, dowel rods and then erase myself out in each image. So uh, <laughs> I guess uh, symbolically, I'm, I'm in each one of the images, but also not in the images as well. Keely, would you like to share? Sorry, I just love, just love what Jeremy just said. I was just, just taking it in for a second there. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, oh yeah, the question is on healing. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, healing is kind of like, it's, it's like resilience. It's sort of, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like the theme of any work you do. I, I certainly run into when I'm working with indigenous communities, it's just like, no, there's no, um, there's no way to get away from it. it and it is a, um, it, it can be a really beautiful thing. You know, it's not just a negative thing. Healing is um, a, a part, uh, it's just part of the process to bring um, things back into balance, you know, and back into homeostasis. So I, I really I love that about healing. Um, I would say that um, the reality of healing is that um, right now in most colonial countries, uh, the general attitude towards healing really is uh, let's just wait long enough and eventually enough generations will die that people forget 
and there is no need to do any healing because they'll just be like us. They'll just be part of our culture and they won't have, they'll forget their grievances, et cetera. You know, and that's not really a very good way to do it. And unfortunately, um, they, I will maybe fortunately, there is a, a, enough caring people um, in uh, colonial societies also to make that really difficult <laughs> to pull off. So thank you, all of you allies that are out there. Um, but you know, um, the, the truth of it is, is that the real healing is um, the real way that healing is happening as we speak, and the real way that it will continue to happen is that um, Native peoples are going to continue to gain sovereignty. Sovereignty is a really difficult world word. Um, I am actually working on a story on sovereignty for the geographic right now, and it's what I've discovered is that pretty much every Native person knows the word sovereignty is, and no, every non-Native person has no idea what that really means. It sounds like something that kings and queens practice. Sovereignty just means basically it's essentially self-determination. And um, so uh, from that point of view, essentially what it means is it means uh, getting lands back. Um, it means, uh, and um, allowing people in their communities to determine how they want to live their own culture and how they want to, uh, how they want to carry forward in time. Like, do they want to do the things that they uh, want to do and regulate themselves? It means um, um, your from phone uh, comes just like this one. What? Oh, uh, yeah, and uh, it means, um, it means um, basically, uh, it means letting go of, a, of control over these places and these communities so that they can actually institute their own governments and um, keep their own rules alive instead of having to do, um, jump through all kinds of crazy hoops, just do the kind of things that are normal and regular uh, for the for the community. Um, when that happens, um, and it, you know, honestly, there is no stopping it. This kind of healing, the regaining of sovereignty is happening under our noses and it will happen no matter what. And in 50 years time, the landscape of the United States and Canada will look totally different. It's already happening. Um, sovereignty gains are happening faster and faster as we speak. Um, and um, pretty soon the landscape of say, for example, the American West is not going to be the United States. It's going to be the United States with a bunch of smaller communities um, that are little islands of, uh, that are uh, completely different nations that speak different languages that have different cultures, have um, different practices. And you know, the greatest thing about it is that a lot of the things that the co colonial peoples really want to see happen can only be made happen this way. The re restoration of the forests, uh, the salmon, uh, bringing down the dams, all these kinds of things that environmentalists have, been, environmentalists have been fighting for forever. Native peoples can actually make that happen, but you have to let go <laughs> of control. And, um, uh, and that is where the healing is going to happen. And there's just really no stopping it. So I'm excited for that. And, but the fight will continue and, it, and it, uh, it's a quick question now will it happen quickly enough? Um, and are you going to, uh, as a colonial people, you know, I am also part of this colonial uh, diaspora as well, in a way, because my family has moved here fleeing violence from another country, right? So I'm indigenous, but I'm not indigenous to North America. So I am, I'm part of this as well. And um, the question is, are we going to be able to stand aside um, and welcome this process or are you going to be fighting this tooth and nail every step of the way i personally would rather there's more control when you work with people instead of fighting them the whole way that's all i'd say not sure keely are you still in your shot there you are oh yes i'm just meeting the puppy exactly not a problem um, yeah, speaking to healing, so I love what Keely and Jeremy had to say about this a lot, I think, and I like what Keely mentioned about healing also being a complicated word, like, we're kind of forced into that healing as well, because if we don't, what's, the other option isn't great either. Um, I think it's important to mention that when Bubsy and I started this work together, well, we started talking about it a long time ago. It's been in the motion for a really long time. But when we actually started making the work, we were living together and sharing this physical space. And none of the work was 
were planned. They weren't necessarily even discussed in length. And it was very much a part of our everyday. You know, we just go to the studio and, and do something. So it all came very naturally. I'm speaking pretty specifically to our project, not as broad as the other artists. Um, in a lot of the images, you can see that we're embracing each other. I actually like that you picked this one because this is one of, I think one of the only images where I'm really holding Bubsy. Um, and we did it deliberately that she was holding me in a lot of the images, symbolically my heart, space for me, space for me to heal my ancestral trauma that had been inflicted on my ancestors from her ancestors. And so in a very personal, direct way, we're working on those threats and healing ourselves together and then collectively in our communities. And I think that Bubsy and I have a lot of hard conversations together. And they're always beautiful. They always take us somewhere. And we're coming from really different spaces. And I think that in the greater context of healing for Indigenous communities, which sure, we're trying to do that, but can we even be there yet? Because we're not acknowledging what's happened. There is still so many people that doesn't know what has happened in these cult countries to Indigenous people and what continues to happen. So while Bubsy and I's work is completely about healing, and I feel that it really has done that for the two of us, um, and therefore spans into our community in a broader sense. Can we even heal yet? I'm, I guess I'm posing that as a question. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think that of course healing is ongoing um, and will be forever. I, unfortunately, I don't see a day in which there isn't harm and violence inflicted on us anytime soon, at least. I hope for that day, but we're not there yet. And so, I think the healing is kind of a double-edged sword. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna get off. So um, I'm going to give this over to Judy. Is she still here? Um, to um, pose any I'm questions? Hi. Hey, that hey. have come up in the chat. All right, um, so let's, I'm going to unshare. Yay. <laughs> yay. There's everybody. We're back. Woo. All okay. Right. All right. Um, we do, we have had a few questions come up in chat and um, I know Keely and Jeremy have answered a few of them, but I'm going to go through them for those of you who were not following along with the chat. Um, and, and this question is for Keely. We have a lot of questions for Keely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if anybody has any for um, any of the other artists, um, the other two artists, we're happy to entertain those as well. So Keely, have you kept in touch with the students in in the um, in your project? Yeah, I do. I, I, I talk to Lily in particular all the time uh, over Facebook because, you know, Facebook is the social media of <laughs> social media for Native peoples for the most part. Um, and uh, yeah, she's great. She's great. So the, the pandemic is uh, by and large uh, not really affecting things over on the island because uh, leaders have been smart and cut off all travel over there. Um, but um, what, yeah, whether or not I end up going back there is um, a, a known question at this point in time. I, I have funding and all that kind of stuff to go, but uh, the pandemic, it was supposed to go this year and the pandemic has derailed that. Um, um, and somebody, and I'm going to kind of alter this question a little bit. Um, and somebody said, um, your work is compelling. Um, and do you see photographing um, these students um, or this, um, or this um, community over time to see how growth and change is happening there? Um. I think that the scale, uh, the scope in uh, time of which these kinds of changes happen is uh, slow enough that for a photographer in like a human scale, it's tough to do immediately. You know, uh, one of the things that indigenous peoples have is a really deep sense of patience because it felt like the things, the pace of change is really slow. I mean, I'm, I'm sure if I, I revisit St. Lawrence in 10 years, things will be significantly different enough to notice. Um, 
but it's probably 20 years time until I would notice it with my camera, you know, in a really significant way without having to interpret it um, mentally, you know, through words and that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I grew up in a very small town and I can completely relate to uh, it. Uh, we, we call it glacial changing. <laughs> so it doesn't happen fast. Okay. Um, all right. So um, this, this question is for, or comment question is for um, Kaylee. Can you speak a little bit more about your process? People were really interested in that as well as the, um, the collaboration and the, um, and the multimedia aspects of it. Definitely. Um, I can speak to the tintype process. Is there, do you want me to run through how to make a tintype? I don't think so. I mean, I just really like, you know, that, you know, you have the tintype and then you have, you know, the painting on it and the different elements in it. I, um, no. Yeah. Sorry. Just I'll learn not <laughs> to my earrings. Um, <laughs> so, well, I learned how, I've wanted to learn how to do tintypes for a long time. I also work with metal. And I do love instant gratification. I don't like digital photography. I like analog. So in that sense, it combines those two things for me. And I think that the tintype process, wet plate collodion process really lends to collaboration because you bring the person that you're making images with into the dark room and they get to see that whole process with you. And that is, that's the most beautiful part to me. And then we get to look at the image. So Bubsy and I get to look at the image together and then we get to decide if we want to change how we're photographing. Um, which is quite challenging because they're self portraits and we're nude. So we're kind of like guessing where we're gonna be and the depth of field is really shallow. And so the focus is hard to get. And, um, and that also speaks to us I think it was Keely that said about the letting go. Like that's mm -hmm. also part of the process is letting go and just seeing how it turns out. And so the tin types combines my two mediums and then Bubsy, um, her art practice is mixed media and a whole bunch of different mediums. She's incredibly talented. And I think if I'm not speaking correctly, drawing and painting are some of her first loves. So that also, um, if we're talking about love and healing, then we're combining our first loves, our first loves of art and each other. Um, and so that lends to the process a lot and I think speaks to what we're trying to do together. And then having the element of the earth, a uh, pressed flower, then being put into a digital file that's, two, that's now two dimensional, that, I don't know exactly, again, how to verbalize that, but that was purposeful as well. Mm -hmm. And then picking specific flowers to include. And so I guess the process looked like us living together, going to make the tentatives together, which I can elaborate if somebody wants. And then Bubsy having the files and drawing and painting on them digitally, mm -hmm. as well as adding the mixed flowers. And then I get to see them and we get to talk about it. So that's really exciting for me too. That's almost like getting a real film back, but even better. And I've been so floored by everything that she's done. And I'm very traditional when it comes to photography. <laughs> and so this was a huge stretch for me. And it's just completely blown me away what she's able to do um, with the images. It just adds this other element that, um, that wasn't reached with the images alone that we were making together. Wonderful, thank you. That ex that explains a lot, and I lo I love the process, and I love how it's collaborative, and it incorporates all of these different elements um, in there to to tell your story. I think it really is very compelling and very very um um just a really great storytelling process as well. Thank you so much, Judith. I also feel compelled to add that one of us or both of us was sick or really exhausted or something or other every time we went to make images together. So <laughs> I would like pat on the back for us if we were still able to do it. Oh, I, I'm, well, I, I believe we are all so glad that you all worked through that and made it happen no matter what. So yeah, I understand. Um, this question is for Jeremy. 
Um, and I believe it's, fr um, I believe it was from Aileen and I believe she had to leave us, but um, I, I think it's a great, um, it's a great, um, great question. It's kind of a two part. Um, how did you come about this way of storytelling? And then what did you take away from your very first shoot with the arrows? Oh, sure. Um, well, the uh, project itself actually came out of my um, landscape photography and history project. And so when you're, <clears throat> when you're working with 10,000 uh, years of history and archaeology and anthropology, you can kind of just do whatever you want um, when it comes to uh, being an artist and being creative because my goal was to um, <clears throat> kind of get everyone to look at this work that's really emotionally compelling, wonder more about it, and then get led into the um, kind of local history, um, which can be more dry or it can be more remote and harder to get into. And so, like I said before, it's all related, which is really um, fun to work that way. Um, and then um, a lot of the pictures were actually shot at a uh, residency called Vermont Studio Center, where you're up in uh, Johnson, Vermont for a whole month with 40 other artists. And um, I just came out of uh, doing that research. I was wondering, like, what can I do away from home when you can't take photos of this uh, unique landscape? And so with everyone being so open minded and so wonderful, I did a lot of uh, collaborative work with um, other artists. And um, I was so lucky to have uh, Steve Locke. He's not a uh, native or nat he's not a photographer either, but he's an awesome teacher and um, studio artist. And so I, I was kind of uh, wary of my first shoots with this project, but he kind of um, convinced me that it was uh, worth continuing. And so uh, thanks to him, it's, it's a, a full-fledged project. Wonderful, thank you. And Donna, you had a question for Jeremy? Yeah, Jeremy, tell, tell us a little bit about this um, community art space that you are currently trying to develop um, in New York. Oh, sure. Um, behind me with my green screen background, you can get a little bit of a glimpse of the, um, <laughs> the house that's being built and uh, worked on. But the uh, house is based on the uh, Shinnecock Reservation. It was built in the 60s. And due to COVID, a lot of my um, exhibits and programs were canceled. So this is a project that's just down the road from me. And since I don't have a lot of funds, it's uh, become this um, sort of community um, fundraised uh, project, which once it's completed, will um, serve as my home, my studio, but also an artist residency for uh, Black, Indigenous, and artists of color along with uh, dedicating the front of the house to um, public and community um, art workshops and educational um, events. So I'm, I'm very excited, but it, it'll be maybe a year before it's ready. And, um, what is your Instagram handle, Jeremy? Oh, my uh, Instagram for the uh, Moz House project is uh, at Moz House Studio. I've been watching um, Jeremy's progress since um, I discovered his work and it's pretty amazing. So I encourage everyone to check it out. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? You're welcome to open up your mic and just go ahead um, and ask if you have anything else. Eloise, you got a good question? <laughs> just put you on the spot there. You there have you put me on the spot and I didn't really have a question, but can you say anything about some of the work that you've done about murdered and missing Indigenous women and um, how that in any way might connect or just even as a standalone question? I'm not sure that everybody knows all about what has been happening in Canada with uh, that genocide and also obviously in the United States where it hasn't been as well recognized, I don't think. That's my mom. I was hoping she'd ask a question to a different artist, but serves the right <laughs> player on the spot. <laughs> um, I, I, most of my work, this included, is all grounded in voice and visibility and accurate representation of Indigenous folks and um, 
and also talking about how we can't separate ourselves from the land. I think that that is a common theme that settlers, if you will, like to lean into um, in order to benefit from resource extraction. And we are inseparable of land. We are the land, the land is us. Um, resource extraction is placed upon us isn't the right word, but there's so many extractive processes that happen in our communities. Um, and I would view the epidemic of and genocide of indigenous women as part of that. And I think that all of our work applies to the massive issue of murder and missing indigenous women, girls, trans and queer folk across the world. You know, we're all in our, each of us in our individual practices are uplifting the communities in which we are surrounded by. I love this project that you just described, Jeremy and Healy, the mass just blew me away. And all of that is pushing back against the violence that is committed against us. All of that is affording voice and visibility and accurate representation and community and healing and education to ignorant racist folks. So I think that all of the work shown today um, could, could fall into something that's helping to heal mm -hmm. this incredible issue. Mm -hmm. I think it's it, uh, uh, speaking uh, to missing and, missing and murdered indigenous women. Also, I'm um, uh, like I, for there was a moment in time when I was seriously considering uh, making a big story and um, trying to work on uh, an MMIW um, you know uh, narrative, especially being here in uh, Duwamish territory in Seattle. You know, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on with the Seattle Indian Health Board and all of that here. But ultimately, I you know just have to make the decision that. Uh, there are some people that are more right for telling this story and not even from the point of view of like who in terms of representation, but but who can actually do the story better and to do it justice. And um, part of that would be like, you know, I'm a, I'm a man <laughs> not from North America. So that that's like, it's better for someone um, else to pick that up and you know, like that space that would be occupied by me, which is uh, takes up the space that someone else can potentially I can support someone else to do it. And, and as a result, um, you know, I'm seeing like some of my colleagues like Taylor Irving and, um, and other people like that who have picked up um, and started working on the, that stuff. Um, so, and, you know, it kind of, it's a little bit odd because there's always this question, like um, if you have a lot of exposure and generally speaking, indigenous issues, we could just use a lot more voices rather than less, you know, generally. Um, but at the same time to, and so, you know, it's a question, do, do you use your platform to what things are you going to choose to tell? But I, I think ultimately they, whatever it is that we choose to do, we have to do it really right. And if we can't do it right, then it's maybe better to let someone else do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know what, Keely, I think that's a great segue into another question for you actually. <laughs> Um, no, but but it was, and and I, you know, I understand that, and and this I think kind of ties into that is like when you begin working with um, a new indigenous community, what steps do you take to respectfully um, and accurately portray um, those people or that place? Uh, you know, I when when they asked that question before, um, I thought it was a really good answer. Uh, a real, a reminding me of actually how I answered this question before, which is that I'm getting to know a new community and um, learning to, to uh, understand it accurately is a lot like learning a new language, right? It's the very beginning. Um, most people and most photographers when approaching uh, a, a new community or any of us, you know, like there's, there's situations where we go where we, we have to be culturally fluid regardless of where we are, unless you happen to live in the same community where you grew up your entire life, you will run into another culture. And the only way to understand it is um, like learning a new language is to be bold at first and be willing to be humble. And to really kind of, it, it helps a lot to turn off your own culture entirely as best you can. And it's really difficult, it's impossible, right? But, but the less that you say, like if you're learning Spanish, uh, the more that you can turn off the English and only speak in Spanish, the better you will be and the faster you will learn um, and the closer you will get to it. 
And the more languages that you learn, the more easy it is to understand other languages regardless because you pick up phonemes, you pick up things that are not possible in the first language that you know. But other languages give you concepts and sounds and utterances and things that you can hear. So the more cultures you know, the more that you can understand other possibilities. But more than anything, it has to do with patience and immersion. So you spend, um, spend, spend time doing it, but it's, this is why the idea of um, the old parachute journalism idea is kind of fraught. You can't jump into a place and spend a week there or even a month there and really expect to understand it and report on it um, or uh, tell a story in any kind of accurate way. So that doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's best to be very meta about it and just recognize and say, this is my understanding. This is what I've seen and this is my experience. You know, this is my experience and so that's fine. But if you really want to be able to approach another culture and actually see from that point of view, which I think is one of the things that we're most sorely lacking, it takes a long time and you have to really put away your own culture. That's really difficult to do. But if you can commit to putting away your own culture and spending being immersed in a place for a long time, you can get there. Not And you will never truly get there, right? You can never be a native speaker of a new language um, unless you grew up with it. But I would say that you can become serviceable. <laughs> it can become useful. So um, I think that's the metaphor I'll leave you with. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else have any, th any more questions? Even Donna or Shelly, anybody? Um, I think there's one in the chat, Judy. Oh. Um, the publications from Darnell? Yeah. Okay, are there any Native American publications or media outlets that speak to current events? Um, and can you name some of your favorite indigenous organizations that support the communities that we can give support to? Um, start with uh, publications. Yeah, Jeremy, Jeremy you wanna yeah. start with Jeremy and then we'll just to go around. Sure. <laughs> Um, I'll just very briefly mention uh, Indian Country Today if you prefer text or if you're big into podcasting, uh, Native America Calling uh, almost every day has a new um, podcast with uh, contemporary Native news. And Say that one again, Jeremy. That one's um, Native America Calling. Native and, America Calling, okay. And so just like the title uh, suggests, they have a lot of people call in, give their own opinion of news, but they're very much like NPR style of just native news today, which is awesome. And then uh, Running Strong for American Indian Youth, I always try to encourage people to know and uh, if they're able to uh, give to their nonprofit. Eating Sovereignty, I think I'm remembering that right. And Say that one again, Kaylee. I think it's seeding sovereignty. Okay, like seeding C E D. Yes. Okay. Wait. I'm not Wait. sure I can spell sovereignty. <laughs> S E D C E D. <laughs> and then uh, my friend Ginger does a wonderful podcast, Broken Boxes podcast, that is definitely worth checking out. Yeah, in terms of publications, uh, I would say uh, things that kind of cross over into the mainstream a little bit. Uh, High Country News is a really excellent uh, like indie country department that is um, <laughs> uh, that Tristan Atone is the editor of, and um, so that's a really good one. It gives you um, a look at how Indian uh, affairs are going on simultaneously as what's going on with the rest of the West. This kind of gives you context for things, which is good. Um, also, in terms of podcasts, uh, Media Indigena is one of my favorites. It's out of Canada. Um, it's with Rick Harp, and it's it's really kind of academic, um, but very sassy. Um, they are no holds barred. They will tell you exactly what it is they're thinking, but it comes from some deep Indigenous philosophy, Indigenous scholars. Uh, talking about stuff in a very like uncompromising fashion. So prepared to have your feelings hurt, but it's really good. Um, it is excellent. Um, and Indigenous Environmental Network is uh, another really good one, um, especially because so many Indigenous issues are intertwined with environment stuff. Uh, it's not a podcast that it is a publication, uh, an online publication. Okay. 
I think I put podcast next to the ones that people identified as podcasts. I'm trying to type some of these into the into the chat. So, so before we um, close and give our thank yous and whatnot, can yeah. each one of you just um, tell us what you're working on now or what you're working on next? And we can start with um, Kaylee. I can't see her, but hello. Um, I'm like constantly playing catch up, uh, <laughs> but not to get too much into my personal life, but I suffered a pretty bad uh, concussion almost two years ago. And uh, as far as well as other complicated things in my personal life. And currently I'm trying to say no to new projects and get myself <laughs> on my feet a little bit more um so that I can start dreaming big again and I don't think I'm actually in a space to talk about my ideas publicly at the moment um because they're still formulating but there's always tons of ideas Bubsy and I have more things in the works um but yeah taking a little time to recalibrate organize hard drives that kind of thing mm -hmm. fresh start. mobile dark room you know Hey, thanks. Jeremy. <clears throat> oh, sure. Um, I think every single day I, I go down to Ma's house and just um, work on the renovation. Like today I went down with the uh, spray foam and there's some pretty big <laughs> gaps where you could just see to the outside. <laughs> so um, did some of that today, some reciprocating saw work, just uh, filling the holes in the floors. And um, just like Kali, I, I really hate ed editing old photos, but that's something I need to do and I feel guilty about as well. <laughs> Healy? I've always got a bunch of things going on. Uh, so let's see, hopefully in November, I am supposed to be um, uh, prototyping a new uh, Zai, which is one of our kayaks, our traditional kayaks that um, a, a has, uh, Boat Historian has finally come out with um, unearthed some plans from one of our historic boats. And so I'm trying to um, reproduce uh, it. Um, and uh, it's really exciting because we only have one extant one in a museum and it's, uh, it's the two hole variety instead of the one seater. So that's really exciting. And then um, also we've got uh, two other, uh, three other major stories going on, but just very briefly on working on one on indigenous conservation, um, which is uh, kind of an oxymoron it, a, or like a sort of a nonsense statement because the word conservation doesn't really exist in most native languages, it's just culture. Um, but um, to just give you the elevator spiel behind that, you know, uh, indigenous peoples are 5% of the world's population around some something like that global population, but 80% um, of the world's biodiversity is on, is managed by um, indigenous people on their lands. So uh, that 80% by 5% is pretty powerful. Something's going right. <laughs> um, so that's the story I'm working on. And then lastly, I've got a fine art series I'm working on, which is um, on animism. I haven't figured out what a title yet. I'm toying around with the idea of titling it Harmonic Convergence after the, uh, after the phenomenon from Avatar The Last Airbender. <laughs> But, uh, but uh, yeah, it's just a, a series of seeing the land through the, the, uh, from an animistic pre major world religion point of view. Uh, so yeah, all these different things, many irons in the fire. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for coming, um, and listening tonight and for Judy hosting and Shelly narrating because God knows all I had to do was like turn the PowerPoint and I'm not sure I passed that test. So I'm <laughs> glad everybody else was here. Um, and especially for all of the artists who mm -hmm. I just wish I could jump through my screen and hug you all. I cannot wait to be able to meet you live. Yeah. Um, and right. the, thank you so much, Donna. Thanks for inviting us to, to help out with this project. It was a really great to see everyone. It was great to meet Keely and Jeremy and Kaylee. Um, I really love your work and it was so great to see you and hear about your projects. 
Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of all of you. I'm really excited for it. And hopefully um, we will be able to travel and go to see the show when it opens at the Griffin Museum in June of 2021. Maybe we'll all be able to uh, do something by then. I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> and the exhibition is up at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights um, through December 31st. So okay. you can check out all of the work again um, there. All right, perfect. Thanks. All right, all, thank you all very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Um, thank you, and um, hopefully we'll thank see you, you soon. Buddy.